Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, guys. I hope you're well. Welcome to the, I've completely forgot, just quickly, actually, a very quick um, piece of housekeeping. I'm exhausted. So uh, this will either be one of the best live streams I've ever done or horrendous. Um, it, I don't think there'll be any in between. I think it's going to be one of those two, either brilliant or terrible, uh, both things through not through my doing just through chance really so either apologies firstly or thank me later um <clears throat> i'm utterly utterly destroyed um energy wise uh, you can probably hear it in my voice a little bit as well uh, i feel okay i'm just very you know, i'm not ill i just feel very tired the reasons for which <laughs> will become clear very soon. Um, firstly, though, uh, more housekeeping. Uh, if you haven't checked out the Substack newsletter list, it's down below in the description. Uh, and also down below in the description is the link to register, register rather, here we go, register for the, uh, <clears throat> oh dear, this is terrible. Hang on a minute. Let me have, this is water, I promise. This is going to be an interesting live stream, guys. Um, sorry, so let's start again. The Substack, if you're still watching, you're amazing. Um, the Substack newsletter list is in the description, as is registration for, or not registration, but registering your interest for the Mark Ellis Academy, which is kicking off later this year. Um, there's no tie-ins with either, either of these things. The Substack newsletter is a thing that I send out every Friday. It's just a written newsletter where I muse on this industry a bit like I'm doing now and um, you can unsubscribe anytime if you don't enjoy it no hard feelings and equally the uh, mark of this academy is basically just adding yourself to a list to a list to hear more about it when it's ready um, so yeah if you haven't done that yet go for it if you've already subscribed to both of those things thank you it's very much appreciated we've had lots of new sub uh, substack uh, newsletter list people already over the last few weeks which is much appreciated um so I can see a few people are coming into the uh, live stream as we speak. Hello, guys. As always, I'm not. I'm purposefully not looking at the live chat window because I don't want to be distracted. But please put any questions you've got in there, um, anything that comes up during what I'm about to talk about, or any questions that you have generally. I've just remembered that someone did email me, which I'm going to uh, with, with some questions. Uh, that's a good point, actually. If you watch these, if you don't watch these live, because I know it's difficult to get on onto these based on the time that I do them uh, for, for certain regions. Uh, if you can't get on them, but you do have questions for me, just send me an email. Um, the best email address is, uh, is a new one, actually. It's mark at markellismedia.uk. If you send it across to that, I can answer your questions. So I'll, I will try and remember to answer that email live on this on this live stream later. Um, if, I don't, if I forget, because my brain's all over the place, I'll do it next week. Um, so uh, what we'll do, we'll do Q&As in a bit. Uh, but first, I'm going to talk about live events and specifically working with brands. So if you tuned into the live stream last week, um, I sat here with loads of gear, cameras and mics and tripods and all sorts of stuff, um, just, just to show you what I was taking to IFA this year. Uh, and IFA is, uh, just very quickly, it's a, a European tech convention, exhibition, whatever you want to call it. It's um, all about consumer tech. It's absolutely humongous. Um, it's a bit like CES in, in the States, which happens every January in, um, in Vegas. But this one is in Berlin, and it lasts for about five days if you count the the press days and uh, it was my first one so I, I was invited there by a brand which I'm going to talk about in a moment um, and I got back yesterday now this what I'm about the, the story that I'm about to tell has nothing to do with content creation has nothing to do with solo club but when I started this solo club channel and this solo club brand part of the reason for doing it was to give you a warts and all kind of insight into what happens as a, as a, you know, in, in the life of a, of a creator. Um, and this is probably the wartiest, I said, this is what I said on, on, on the Substack newsletter last week. Uh, sorry, when, when did I mention this? I think I mentioned this in, in a, it was a Substack newsletter. Um, I called it the wartiest behind the scenes thing ever. Uh, so basically, I flew out to Berlin on all the days are kind of molding into one, but on Thursday last week, on the 31st, and um, I'll explain who I was going out with in a moment, but um, basically I, I got flown out, and the flight was my first ever connecting flight. So I left Birmingham in the UK, went to Munich, that's where the connection was, got from Munich to Berlin, and then that was my final destination. Great. 
you'd think. Um, got off the plane, got through to baggage uh, handling, and did that thing where you wait for the, you know, the rev- rev- revolving kind of baggage claim belt thing to go past. And all these suitcases came out and came past. And normally with this, I'm all, for some reason, I'm always last. My suitcase always trundles around last. Um, so I wasn't too concerned to begin with. But the longer I waited, the more I was thinking something's not right. And um, the same suitcases kept coming past after a while, again and again. And there was me and about three or four other people that were waiting. And um, I looked up at the screen above the belt and it said, finished against our flight. And that's when dread and horror and this horrible, horrible sinking feeling started to literally sink in. Um, my baggage wasn't there, basically. So what I'd had, I had a, um, a, a kind of you know, a rucksack with all my camera gear. Thankfully, I didn't put that into the hold. I did take that on as hand luggage. I very nearly checked it in. I'm so glad I didn't. It would have been even worse if I'd done that. Um, so I had that on me. But I had a big suitcase because I was staying for six, was it five nights, six days, five nights, something like that. Um, and I had a lot of stuff, I had a lot of stuff to wear. Um, so I had a big suitcase with all my clothes and some, a couple of tripods, a couple of the tripods that I showed you last week. So the, the, the brand new carbon fiber tripod that I bought uh, and also the PGY Tech uh, Mantis pod, which is the kind of vlogging thing. They were both in there as well. And some other stuff that I just needed, uh, toiletries and all sorts of things. Um, nothing particularly exciting, but, you know, life's essentials. So that is what didn't come round on that belt. Um, and this, this is the first time it's ever happened to me. People who are watching this, either live or in the future, I guess that there's normally some, I don't, I don't know what the, what the stats are, but you know, one in X number of people have, have probably experienced this at some stage. Um, but it was my first time. So um, I kind of walked across to the bagging, I think they call it the bagging tracing area in, in the, the Berlin airport. And... Um, yeah, so look, my, my baggage isn't there. And the guy behind the, the, the thing, who was very nice, said, okay, uh, just fill this form in and we'll, we can send it on to the, the hotel that you're staying at or we can send it back to your house, whatever you want. So I said, okay, let's send it to the hotel I'm going to. And, and then I said, how long do you think that will take? And he said, well, it could be tomorrow, uh, but it could be three days. And, and at that point I said, three days? But surely if it's in Munich, which is presumably what's happened, you just got a, you know, an hour's flight from Munich to send it to Berlin then send it to my hotel, please. And he said, we can't guarantee when that will happen. So I filled this form out <clears throat> and then hot footed it basically from the airport because this was about five o'clock in the evening and I had a dinner thing to go to. So I hot footed it from the airport, found a branch of H&M clothes store uh, somewhere in Berlin and went shopping, you know, went shopping for clothes and pants and socks and pants in the UK being things that you wear beneath your pants if you're in the US. Um, way too much information, but you, you know what I'm saying. I had to go and buy lots of stuff, toiletries, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, thankfully, managed to get to the hotel just in time to go out for dinner, uh, and uh, that was that. And to cut a very long story short, I still don't have my baggage. And remember, this is we're, we're a week later now, actually, so it's, it's been pretty much exactly a week since they lost my baggage, and it hasn't turned up yet. And it appears to be lost in the system somewhere. And uh, that was, uh, again, we're not here to talk about my baggage problems, but this happened during a, a creator expedition, if you want to call it, you know, time out on the road. And um, because I've, I've never lost my luggage before. I've never, someone hasn't lost it for me before. Um, and it's amazing how much it throws you out. You, you know, you lose, you almost lose your identity. You know, it's, it's all your stuff that's just not there anymore. Um it's just amazing how much hassle it causes. And I had to keep going shopping. I went, I went shopping about three times for clothes during a, a work trip. I've never done that in my life. I might have bought a pair of shoes before, you know, emergency pair of shoes, but I've never been properly shopping for stuff three times. I even had to buy a suitcase to take stuff back. It's just... Anyway, Lufthansa, if anyone from Lufthansa is watching, I know it's not your fault personally, but I will be hitting you with a massive bill. Trust me, I'm really going for it. Um, incredibly angry about it, and it made everything more stressful than it needed to be. So that is why I'm a little bit jaded. Um, and also, six days away from home is a long time, particularly when you've got a, a young family. Um, and also, there's an awful lot of work involved, which I'm going to talk about now. Um, so that's the precursor to all of this and why I sound a little bit croaky and why some of this may not make sense. Um, and I, while I was saying that, I was thinking maybe these live streams never make sense. Who knows? So I'm a bit all over the place, but let's just have a laugh. We're all friends here, aren't we? Um, so I thought what you might find interesting with this is how it works when it comes to 
going going abroad with brands and what why why you do this why they want you to do that uh, and how it works when you get there so i've done a few of these now i've done a few um in the uk I've done some stuff in london but i've also been to paris i've been to amsterdam uh, munich at Berlin a couple of times, um, and one or two other places. So it's taken me around some quite interesting locations that I haven't been to before. Uh, I've been to London lots of times, but apart from that, I hadn't been to any of those other places. So um, it's firstly, travel-wise, it's great. It gives you this insight into the world that you may not have seen unless you go on holiday there. Holiday there. Um, but what happens with these brand events is that uh, if you take Brand X, for instance, they basically have a... It might be a product launch, or it might be, in this case, a, you know, a stand a, a, at an exhibition. And what they tend to do is get a bunch of, it's a mixture of people. So it's basically uh, YouTube creators like myself, and also press, you know, kind of, you know, press people who write for magazines and who, who may run YouTube channels for bigger publications. So you have these two kind of factions, um, and they bring them all together in, into like an, a, a, a kind of invite list uh, and, and literally invite you to the event. And it's normally the ones that I've done. They, they tend to, depending on the size of the brand, obviously. But bearing in mind, I've done it. I've done it with Panasonic. I've done it with Honor, most recently at IFA. That's that's who I, I was with this weekend, and a few others. It, it can be anywhere between eight to 15, 20 people. So it's quite a big list. Um, and they 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 fly you out. So everything is paid for. They pay for your flight. They pay for your accommodation. They take you out for dinner. Um, you, know, you, you can't go shopping for toiletries and pants and expect for them to pay that. So that didn't that wasn't covered. Um, but they pay for everything. Everything you'd, ex you'd you, not that you'd expect, but the you know, the, the, the kind of expenses uh, that you would normally incur if you go yourself off your own back, um, which is lovely. So you get you don't have to worry about anything. Um, and the PR team which might be internal, it might be the PR team for the brand, or it might be an external PR company. It's normally the latter uh, that look after that, that brand. They take you out and they do everything for you. you I was joking with one of the, the journalists over the weekend that those sort of trips, are what you basically do is just follow people. So you, you get your flight from wherever you, they've booked it for you, you land, you go through arrivals, you meet everyone, and then you just follow people because you they know where they're going. You know, they, they take you to your hotel, they take you to dinner that evening, and then if there's some kind of event going on, they take you to that. You have this kind of itinerary that you go through. Um, it's just it's it's like a bit like a school trip. I don't know if you know if you if you were in your childhood, if you had school trips where they take you somewhere and you, you just kind of follow the teacher. It's like that, um, but for grown-ups. So it's um, it's all very well organized. None of these events that I've done have been badly organized. Um, they're, they're very much, um, there's a lot of duty of care going on. They want, they want to make sure that you're, you know, you're happy and you know where you're going, that you're fed, you're watered, you've got a nice bed for the night. It's really nice. Now, as you'd expect, the reason it's really nice and the reason all this stuff is so you know, runs like clockwork and you get the not the best of everything but you get, you get some nice stuff um it is because they want to impress you obviously we are press we are youtubers we're people who are going to talk about these brands review their products etc etc so they want you on side really um and it's important to say obviously at that stage that that doesn't influence your opinion of the products and it, and it shouldn't if it does there's something wrong um you know I, i've had this with for instance, Sony is a great example of this. They have taken me to a couple of things in London, um, but I will still say if their products suck, which sometimes they do. So for instance, the Sony XM5 headphones, I'm not a big fan of those at all. I won't, just because they take me to London and send me out on a boat with some nice cameras and give me a nice lunch, I, I will still, still say that the Sony XM5s are terrible. Now, whether or not that potentially jeopardizes that relationship, I have no idea. I can't speak for Sony on that. It shouldn't do because you know they, they want genuine opinions out there. So, but that's important. I can't speak for other creators and other press people. Um, but I think the fact that the press do go out and these are people who are writing for Engadget and Laptop Mag and these big publications, they have to be very much, you know, very um, what's the word? Uh, have their own have their own opinions. Basically, there's a word for that, and because my brain's not working, I can't think what the word is. Um, partisan that's it isn't it um so that, that that's important to mention that but equally they do want to impress you and they want to show that they're they're a nice brand they can look after the people that they're bringing out um and the whole purpose of these events is like i say it's either to show you a new product or it's to take you to the event they're exhibiting at take you to the stand again show you new products or whatever it might be um or introduce you to the owner you know, the ceo who's doing a talk somewhere um 
that's pretty much the the remit. And what they don't do, and this might be something that surprises you, they never say, or the ones that I've done anyway so far, um, haven't said to me, so you can come out, it's all paid for, uh, this is what you'll be doing, uh, but we'd like a, you know, an Instagram story, we'd like a, an Instagram reel, we'd like a, a YouTube video, we'd like that content producing. None of these brands have ever asked me for that at all. They literally just invite you out and then off you go. You do the stuff that, that happens during the event. Now, inevitably, well, not inevitably, there's, there's two things you can do with that. One of them is you can just go along for the ride, get a nice free dinner, get a lovely hotel stay, meet some new people, do a bit of networking, get your hands on some products that haven't been released yet, and then go home. I, if you do that, my guess is that you probably won't be invited that often in the future because what they're expecting, although it's not explicitly said, is some kind of coverage. You know, if, if you're a journalist, you're gonna get they're gonna get coverage in that magazine, obviously. But if you're a YouTuber, in the back of their, their minds, they're thinking, hopefully, Mark is gonna do some YouTube store, uh, sorry, uh, Instagram stories, a couple of reels, maybe TikTok video, maybe he'll do a YouTube video. But they never ever ask for it, which fascinated me when I first did this. So my, my first uh, experience of this was uh, with Oppo, uh, the, the Android uh, manufacturer. Uh, they took me to Paris last, I think it was last September or August. And um, I, it was the first one I'd been on, the first kind of overseas event that I was taken to. And this was for, for the launch of a new phone, which they sent to me beforehand. But again, they sent it to me. They, they didn't say, we'd love to see a, re a review video. It's just a case of, we want to send you this new phone. Oh, and by the way, do you want to come to Paris to celebrate the launch? Okay, great. Um, now, obviously, I did. I, I published a review, which hit the embargo date. I did While I was out there, I did some stories on the in Instagram and a few short form things. But I was never checked up on. I wasn't, no one ever came to me and said, when are you going to publish the video? Um, they just kind of hope that you're going to do it. They can't force you to. And again, this comes down to transparency and letting us do our thing. You know, if 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 that Oppo phone had been terrible, I would have said it wasn't. Thankfully for them, it was a, it was a very good phone. Um, but yeah, they, they they just kind of let you get on with it. So there's no. It doesn't feel like there's any pressure to make content. But equally, you have to use common sense. If I went to IFA this weekend with Honor and didn't do anything, so I didn't post a story or a reel or any anything at all, and just sat there and watched it and you know, watched the, the, the keynote and had my free hotel stay, I, I'd have felt like I'd done them a bit of a disservice, really, because I should be covering this stuff. It's my job to cover this stuff, to give my opinion on it, to you know, to relay the news about these new things. Um so it's, it's a bit of common sense, really, even though it's not kind of explicitly told, you know, you're not explicit, explicitly told to, to do anything. It's just common sense, guys. So that's kind of how it works. The other thing to bear in mind with these events, uh, as you might guess, is that it's very much an in and out type thing. So they typically only last a couple of days. You get, you know, so you get flown out normally later on in the day, which means you get there. And you go straight to dinner. You don't get a chance to do any sightseeing. Um, at the most of these events, I've probably had about an hour to do or an, an hour or two to do stuff. It was as in do stuff on yeah, free time. Um, it was a bit different at E for this time. So, you know, we had the 31st, the terrible baggage day. Uh, we had that evening to have um, dinner. And then the next day we watched the keynote, which was the first thing in the morning at, at the EFA conference. And then the rest of the day was actually pretty much left to us to do what we liked. Um, but again, I used my, my brain and a bit of common sense and thought, well, I'm here with Honor. Let's, let's spend some decent time on their stand, see what what it's all about, um, and get some content out there. And I did, and they really appreciated it. You know, later in the evening, um, one of the main uh, PR um, contacts at Honor said, "Look, loved you, loved your stuff. We've sent it off to you know the top brass so they can see it along with everyone, all the content that everyone else has done. Uh, thank thank you very much. That was it. If I hadn't done that, they'd still have fed me that night. But why am I there? What <laughs> I'm not there for a free ticket." Um, so yeah, but but as you guess, you don't because of those very tight time scales, you don't see much of the country. So when I went to Paris for Oppo, uh, and when I went to Amsterdam for JBL, um, I didn't see a huge amount. Uh, JBL, I saw a bit more of the of the, of the city because we did uh, we went on got bikes and biked to di cycled rather to dinner later that night. So we got to see a little bit of the city at night, which was amazing. But you don't you're not a tourist while you're there. You you you're there with the brand. You you do what they say really. You know you have to turn up at on time to do things. Um, I've heard some horror stories. I won't mention the branding in question, but it's a very 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 big one. I've heard some horror stories of people who've been flown 
a long way away, very far overseas to do to go and witness something. Um, and as soon as they get there, really jet lagged and tired and just wanting to go to bed, um, they're sent out straight away, you know, dinner and then go to bed and then wake up for breakfast with people, then go and do this and go and do that. Apparently really terrible um, or very stressful. I've not, ex- I've not experienced that yet. I may never experience it. Um, but the, the fact I've, I've heard about it means I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm at least a little bit prepared <laughs> if it happens. Um, so it's a very tight schedule. I've had to make notes about this, guys, because I'm so tired. So excuse the constant referring to my notes here. Um, the other thing that is amazing with these, I'm very good drink. The other thing that is amazing with these events, and one of the biggest benefits of doing them from, from my perspective that I've learned um, is meeting fellow creators. So I've made some brilliant friends, um, uh, fellow YouTubers, other you know, journalists, etc just by being at these events because you, while you're there you're kind of cocooned in this kind of weird little family <laughs> which consists of the brand the pr people the journalists and the youtubers um so you do get you know it's quite close-knit you, and you spend quite a bit of time with each other um and because of that you get to know people and you know you might have a couple of drinks um which always helps get the conversation going and um but, you know, joking apart, you do get to know these people. Um, as, 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 there's always a WhatsApp group that's put together so you can have a chat. Um, and and it's, I've met some of my most, um, I don't know, some of the best friends I've met in this industry. And, and in fact, in any work setting on these events, um, we all kind of help each other. There were a few instances this weekend where, you know, I was talking to a couple of fellow YouTubers and we were sharing things which you just don't get to share if you're, remote you know if you're talking to each other on whatsapp or through comment sections and things once you get in person with these people with it with these guys it's um it's amazing it's you just like i say you share things you kind of support each other and you have a good and more importantly actually you have a really good laugh i've had some really really good times with with people i don't know if anyone's watching this now i've not i've not looked at the chat room yet but um if anyone here uh, i'm thinking of one person in particular uh, is watching this now or in the future you know exactly who you are um uh, but those connections like i've said before on these live streams are so important and this, this is such an open industry more open than any other industry i've worked in um and for good reason and, and the reason it is open you know we talk about all sorts of things we talk about our experience with with sponsors we even talk about the rates we charge for for sponsorships and we, we're very honest and open about it um and the reason we do that and we the reason we share that is because a lot of, not a lot, but there are people out there, and I, I was one of them once, who undercharge, who don't charge enough for sponsorships, because there's no rule book, there's no sponsorship bible. You just you you go into this completely wet behind the ears, um, and no brand is going to tell you what to charge. You have to quote yourself. And I've under I've under sold myself no end of times in the past, and um, but I've learned my lesson, and I've learned my lesson because I know from other people that these, you know certain rates are achievable. Um, and we had a couple of conversations this weekend where there's one guy in particular who um, realised that he had been underselling himself for quite a while, and I revealed what what we what we do in at, at the Marketless Reviews Empire, um, and he was amazed in terms of what he could potentially charge sponsors, and I I helped him out and. Two days later, he got a big sponsorship deal. So it's that doesn't harm me. It doesn't it obviously doesn't harm him. It's a big benefit. But what it does do, it raises the the value. If, if, if we're all saying the same stuff to these brands, we are raising the value of creators as a whole, which is really important. You know, if creator A is charging X amount, a very small amount for a brand partnership, but creator B is charging ten times that. There's a massive disparity there, and if uh, even worse, if the one who's charging it is a quite a sm- quite a big channel, as let's say they have five hundred thousand subscribers, and the one who's charging ten times that and getting it has got fifty thousand subscribers, there's a horrible disparity there, which makes no sense to brands. It doesn't create any kind of consistency, and we see that every single the result of that every single day. So in my inbox, I get some unbelievable offers, like ter- terribly embarrassing offers for sponsored videos, and it's because of this. I'm convinced it's that. And um, it's, it's people under undercharging. So the more we share this, we share this information and almost create like a like a standard, if you like, an unwritten rule that this is what we all charge, um, it raises the value of creators. And it's, it's really, really important. We have to work together like this, even though technically in, in other industries, we might be seen as competitors. 
because we're all doing, you know, the, the guys that I was working with this working with, the guys that I was with this this weekend were fellow tech creators, you know, people who were doing the, the exact same thing as me for Mark Ellis Reviews. Um, but I don't see them as com competition. It's amazing. It's one of the best. In fact, it is the best thing about this industry. Um, it's absolutely lovely. Um, the other thing that's lovely is the PR people. So the, the PR people that work with these brands who take you out, out to these foreign countries, um, to, in my experience, anyway, I'm not, I don't know if it's always the case, but certainly in my experience to date, are absolutely lovely, um, and not not falsely so. They're, they're, it's very genuine. They're just lovely people, um, and they make the whole thing great. <laughs> I know that's their job. I know exactly that's that's why they're paid. Um, but you do have to be a certain type of person to do that. You have to be very patient. Uh, you have to be outgoing, uh, but not too. Uh, annoying outgoing um and I, again i've met some lovely people doing this in pr and that hasn't always been my experience in the past in other industries it does seem to be something about this tech industry in particular um which is lovely the other thing that is great and this isn't always the case it depends on the type of event that you're invited out to um but quite often it will get you in front of new products products that haven't been released yet and it means you'll either get to take it away with you or you get the you know when it when it is available to review you get one of those things, one of those things that's been released or is, is about to be released. Um, and as I've spoken about before on these live streams, the earlier I can get product um, products to review, the quicker I can get them in front of the audience, the bigger audience I can gather. And equally, I'm not having to buy this stuff, which reduces the overheads for each video, makes this business more profitable, which means I can put all that back into the channel, most of it, apart from buying myself new pants because I don't have any left because of Lufthansa. Um, I can put all of that back into the channel, reinvest it into the business and make better videos. But, you know, and every, everyone benefits from that, basically. Um, was there anything else to mention? So, yeah, so that's that's the, the, the first way that we work with brands um, when we go to these things. The other way is to actually work with them when you get there. So I did two videos um, at IFA with two different brands, which I they didn't fly me out. They just said, look, if you're here do you fancy doing a little sponsored video? To which I said, yes, because the rates were good um, and the products looked good as well. So one of them was a, a robot uh, vacuum cleaner, um, which we've all seen, you know, those kind of things that kind of go around and do the work for you, basically. Uh, the, the, good, the, the interesting thing about this one is that it had a self-emptying station. So the robot va vacuum cleaner went into the station and then all the stuff was sucked up into this little canister thing, basically. So again, massive time saver. Just interesting, not particularly expensive, uh, very well made, just looked like a great product. Um, the other one was a big TV brand. You can see this all on the, on the well, you can see one of those on the channel at the moment. Um, I'm not mentioning them just in case I need to be careful, but it's obvious who it is. Um, but yeah, it was a big TV brand who had two um, global campaigns that were running, which they wanted me to cover and talk about. So not this wasn't a review or anything like that. The other one wasn't a review either. It's just demonstrating and you know, revealing this new product. This one with this other brand, with, with the TV brand, um, or electronics brand rather, um, was a, basically reveal, you know, helping them reveal these two big initiatives. One of them was to do with um, like it's like a green initiative, um, and the other one was to do with uh, women in tech. So interesting stuff. Plus there were some little tech things thrown into there as well, like new TVs that they had there. Um, but for both of those, it was a case of getting to the event and then going to their stand filming some stuff, doing some vlogging stuff in front of the stand, editing it, getting approval, publishing it. And um, that was quite a lesson, actually, in, in certain ways. One of those videos kind of kept going backwards and forwards and a few things that needed changing. No problem with that whatsoever. Um, got there in the end. And I think I think the end result is great. So I'm not doesn't bother me at all. Um, but it was, a, it was a lesson in how much work's involved. And you do then look at the profitability and think, did it work? Was it was it profitable? They were. It worked out to be profitable, I think. But it was. Um, what happened is I spent a lot of time with those two brands, to getting the, getting the shooting done, and getting approvals and stuff like that. Whereas I could have spent some of that time potentially working with other brands or just surveying Efa and walking around it. Which, which, again, you have to you have to judge this stuff and work out how you want to spend your time at these events. Um, and I'm I'm ninety nine percent sure I did the right thing. I think. Uh, it was a great experience for that reason, both the honor stuff and working with those working with those other brands. Um, it was just uh, had this cloud over it all the time, which was the the lost luggage. That one thing just kind of made everything more difficult than it needed to be. So, um, yeah, that's how we work with brands, guys, on live events. Um, I can see that we've got some comments. I'm going to have to stop talking and have a quick drink of water. But let me let me for the first time open the comments. 
the chat window rather. And Johan was in before I even started actually saying, um, so you're looking forward to this one. You're doing lots of work with a few brands at events over the next six weeks. That's brilliant, uh, Johan. Do you want to let us know what, if you don't mind, you don't, have, you don't have to say the brands that you're working with, but perhaps let us know what you're, what, what you're expecting to do with them. Um, hopefully this was interesting, Johan. I don't know if this, this is the kind of thing that you're going to be doing with these brands, possibly. looks like it is if you're doing them at events. Um, but yeah, if you've got any other questions about that, that, that I've perhaps raised while waffling on a moment ago, then go for it. Uh, lots of familiar faces, guys. Welcome, Jakob, Richard, Alan, Chris. Ben, here he is. I might have been referring to Ben, lover of tech. He know Ben knows what this is all about. Ben has been to more events than me by quite a distance. He's very experienced in doing it. Um, he knows what it's all about. And we have a good time, Ben. Time. Um, there's always a few drinks to be had, as you can imagine. It's um, you need to unwind at some stage. Um, depends how much you want to unwind, depending on how how much work you've got to do the next day. Uh, I didn't. I didn't go too silly there. <laughs> Um, but questions, guys, let's have some questions. Let's go for it. Let me try and find questions that I've not seen yet. There's some, some things I'd, I'd love to hear your lost case and your know, lost luggage stories. Just, just to make me feel a bit better that I'm not alone. Um, Johan says nothing worse than lost cases uh, when you have tight schedules to get filming done, etc., and half the stuff is missing. That, that was the problem. I mean, the thing is, I, I had the stuff to get the filming done apart from my tripod, which would have been I, I bought a brand new carbon fiber tripod for this trip, which I showed you last week. Um, that's in that that's somewhere in Germany now and didn't have access to it at all. Um, I don't know when I'm going to need it next either. So that's 90 quid that I could have probably saved. Um, but yeah, it, it, that is what made it very very tricky actually the the the, the tight schedules I, I was kind of running backwards and forwards buying new clothes and then going to do the stuff that i needed to do for work which i, I didn't i didn't allow for that time to, to buy new stuff you know because i didn't think i'd ever have to do that uh, so it's yeah it, it made it very very stressful that there was one moment um which was on uh, i think it was the when was it, the tuesday when I was, I needed to go back into the into the EFA venue and do some more filming to, to get some more filming for one of those brands. Um, I suddenly realised in the morning that I didn't have a suitcase to take stuff back to uh, the UK with me because I had certain things that wouldn't fit in hand luggage. I had, you know, I'd bought stupid things like I'd, I'd bought a bottle of a new bottle of aftershave which was two hundred mil, so I couldn't take that through security. I needed I needed a suitcase to check into the hold on the way back. So I um I thought okay that's great I'm gonna have to go and buy a suitcase. So my girlfriend Jen, who doubles as my studio manager, bless her, managed to find a, a TK Maxx, which was fairly close to the hotel hotel I was staying at, but it wasn't quite close enough to walk given the time that I had. So I am um, I've been using I've, in, in Berlin I've been using those scooters, you know the e scooters. Um, if you hate them, by the way, I'm sorry, but I, I used to hate them. I now absolutely love them. They're so convenient. Um, so I grabbed one of those from the hotel, scooted down to TK Maxx, bought myself a suitcase. Um, I, I put a photo of this on uh, Instagram and, and Twitter. X, sorry. When do we stop doing that? Um, it's the most orange Patrick. You know who Patrick Rambles is? It's a Patrick Rambles suitcase, bright orange. I have no idea why I bought it. I, I, I wasn't really with it. I just thought that will do, bought it. And then realized that I had to get it back to the hotel. And I it was about a 30 minute walk two issues with that one it would have been an irritating walk because it was really hot and also i'd be carrying an empty suitcase which would just be annoying um, and two i didn't have 30 minutes because i had to get back to the hotel to work on the edit that i'd been filming earlier that day horrible um so i did something which i don't recommend guys and this you know kids don't do this at home um it's I don't know if it, hopefully it's not illegal um, but i got back on my lime scooter with the suitcase in one hand, I was holding both handlebars, promise, um, and somehow looped the suitcase through the handlebar, held onto it very securely, and gingerly scooted, not at full speed, I hasten to add, and in cycle lanes, uh, back to the hotel. Made it unscathed, both me and the suitcase. But there was one moment when I thought, if I come off this scooter and people witness it, there's this English guy hurtling down, not hurtling, going fairly slow down the road on an e-scooter with a bright orange suit, empty suitcase. That's going to look incredibly funny, tragic, and quite expensive from my perspective because I'd have to probably go and buy a new suitcase. 
that didn't happen. But there was a moment when I thought maybe that makes good content. You know, if I was filming myself doing it as well, that could be a good TikTok video. Who knows? I didn't, I didn't film myself. But anyway, so I was doing stupid things like that. The last few days have been ridiculous. Oh, and also, I might as well carry on moaning. The, the flight out of Berlin. Berlin airport. I'm sorry if there's anyone here who's German who is very passionate about their airport. I'm not about Heathrow or anything. I don't know why you would be, but if you are, apologies. Um, but I don't care, actually. Um, Berlin airport is utterly horrendous. It's this very new, very swanky airport in, in Germany, um, which doesn't work. None of it works. So the, the check-in desk yesterday, the BA, the BA check-in desk was an absolute mess. People, they set up these queues that didn't make sense. So people were queuing up and then getting to the front and realizing there wasn't a clerk there. The clerks themselves were late, took ages doing anything, kept going backwards and forwards, telling, um, telling off passengers for queuing in the wrong queue, even though there was no obvious place where you were supposed to queue. It was that bad that when we got on the flight, eventually after going through this horrendously long um, security thing, security queue, it was that the check-in thing was so bad that when we were in the on the plane, we sat for an hour on the tarmac because fifteen people were still going through the check-in experience, and we had to wait for them. And then one of those didn't turn up, so they then had to get the find that person's luggage, take it off the plane. By that point, it was almost funny. It was. It, I was just thinking, I just want to get home now. Uh, this can't. It, this this can't get any funnier or more ridiculous. Um, but yeah, the, the whole. Oh god, that Berlin airport. Sorry, guy. If like I say, if you're from Berlin, if it, that airport means a lot to you, I'm. I'm. I'm not sorry. It's horrible. Sorry. Let's not stop saying sorry. Um, <laughs> I've totally lost my train of thought now. Quick, ask me some questions. I'm gonna. Otherwise. I don't know what I'm going to start talking about, which I know is a bit of a, that might be tempting just to leave me to it, but please start asking some questions. Alan, sorry to hear about the disaster with your luggage. Yeah, I'll tell you what a lot, of, thank you, Alan, by the way. Um, what a lot, most people have said to me, the, the very first thing most people who have I've told, I've recounted this story to, I've done, it, I've done it way too many times. People are fairly bored of it now. Um, but the people that I've, I've told this, this story to, everyone has said, did you have an air tag in there? The answer is no. So the guy who reviews Apple stuff didn't put an air tag in his luggage. I mean, that, how much that would have helped, I don't know, because the Berlin airport is so inept at doing anything. Even if I could show them that it was in Berlin airport, which I think it is, it, I don't think it would have helped. But yeah, I, hands up, I should have put an air tag in there. I will do that. Again, you have to learn from this stuff. I've learned that if I ever have a connecting flight again, I'm not checking stuff in ever. Two, if I have to fly with Lufthansa again, which I will try and avoid, but if I do, I'm not checking stuff in ever again, keeping everything on me. And um, what was the other thing? Uh, oh, and then I'll put an air tag in everything, just in case. <laughs> Alan, question. Stopping me ranting, hopefully. Uh, in your experience of YouTube, can publishing a new video damage the performance of your previous, most recent video if it's doing well? Uh, let me read that again. If you Um... I need to read this again, Alan, sorry. In your experience of YouTube, can publishing a new video damage the performance? Of... Right, so I think you mean if, let's say we publish a video and it's it's gone off the charts. It's one out of 10. It's got 30,000 views in a, in, a, in a day, which would be an amazing video. But let's say it's done that. You're, what you're asking, I think, is if you then publish another one, does it take the attention away possibly from that one that was really flying? I think that's what you mean. It's something I've thought about. I do occasionally think about, but I don't think it makes any difference. I don't think it slows the performance of that other video down because uh, the people that have watched it already can then watch your next one. Um, I doubt very much that YouTube would, thro would throttle the previous video because the new one's doing, yeah, the, the new one's come out. If the new one completely tanks, I don't think that impacts the previous video. Each video, I think YouTube would probably say this, that each video is treated very much in its own silo. You know, in terms of the way it performs, it's, it's its own thing. So, um, it, but it's a very good question, Alan, because I do think about that occasionally. If, if I've got a very packed, um, you know, video schedule, I do occasionally think, is this next one going to screw everything up? Um, I, it's it's a it's a really tricky thing. Yeah, I, I'd, I'd completely agree, but I don't think 
it has any impact. The other reason it's tricky is because if you do have a one out of 10 video that's just gone amazingly well, you want to kind of experience that one out of 10 thing for a bit longer at the top of, you, of, of YouTube studio. Whereas if you launch, if you then publish another video straight after that gets a 10 out of 10, that one out of 10 is just, okay, it's still there, but it's, um, <clears throat> that's the, that's the, that's the kind of um, the thing with YouTube studio. It's, a, it's, you're only as good as your last video. So there's that element as well, but that's more of a personal thing. That's something you have to work work through in your head um but yeah <laughs> uh richard how many times a week should you post on social media as often as you can richard i, I think that, that there's no there's no real rule, rules to this at all i think all you need to be, all, all you need to do is be consistent um it, it depends what platform i mean if it's twitter slash x um posting regularly is is definitely worthwhile i think um YouTube is a social media network as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, that's less frequent, obviously, unless you're publishing shorts, which you could do every day if you wanted to. But if you're doing long-form videos, that's perhaps once a week, twice a week, whatever. Um, publish as much as you, as you, as you need to. Just, just concentrate on delivering value and being consistent. Um, now, I'm not really living by my own, thing, my, my own words there because, for instance, on um, Twitter slash X, I'm not particularly consistent. I should be more consistent on there. I'm, I'm going to try and do that quite soon. Um, Instagram, I'm a bit more consistent with, and that is bearing fruit. You know, I'm getting more views. I'm getting more people uh, becoming followers. Um, but yeah, there's no hard and fast rule. I don't think, Richard. I think you just need to work on whatever works for you, basically. God, my, my voice. <clears throat> Chris, um, I don't really have any questions about working with brands because I'm nowhere near that stage yet. I need a channel first. <laughs> that would help, Chris. Yeah, I agree. Um, but it's good to know the industry is open about these things. Yeah, uh, not all of the industry is. I mean, I don't know many creators who do live streams and talk about the brand events they've been on. I've got to be careful how much I say. I can't reveal everything because a lot of it is kind of not secret. But you have to be careful. I don't. I don't. I can't say too much about what they do and. Um, I should say immediately, none of the none of it was paid apart from the accommodation and the flights. That was all covered, um, but they didn't give me money beyond that. So, uh, again, that can that can be different depending on the the um, the partnership that you have as the creator with the with the brand. You might have a paid deal where they pay you a retainer or something. I didn't have that with with Honor, um, but I was yeah, like I said, I was flown out and and put up, which was very nice. Um, keep the questions coming, guys. I've just reminded myself that I do have questions from someone who sent them in. So again, if you're watching this in the future and you can't make these live streams, firstly, I'm sorry. Um, I do keep promising that I'm going to try different times and things. It's just, it's a bit tricky at the minute, um, but we'll, I'm hoping to do something around, around those lines. Um, but I have just remembered that Mike Moorhead, so Mike, thank you very much for emailing me, um, did send some questions. We've got four questions here, so I'll, I'll quickly go through them. But while I'm answering these guys, please do pop your questions in to the chat. Um, so the first question Mike asked was, uh, is it better to shoot in four by three instead of 16 by nine? So for those who aren't aware, I think probably most of you are, um, four by three is like old TV. So they're kind of almost, almost square TV. Uh, 16 by nine is what we pretty much all watch these days, which is widescreen. Um, so he's asking if it's better to shoot in either of those uh, to make it easy to use the video for shorts. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. I mean, if you shoot in four by three, it's going to be a bit easier to crop. I guess because uh, you're not having to deal with quite as much width. Because um, obviously, you go with, with a if you've got a 16 by 9 widescreen video on YouTube and you want to make a short out of it, you can only have about that much of the frame, <laughs> this bit here. So if you ever have stuff that's going on over here or over here, you're going to have to do some post kind of panning, which is quite easy to do. To be fair, any shorts editor can do it, and it's very easy to learn in your editing software of choice. Um, whereas if it's a square. <laughs> four by three roughly um you've had you had less you have less stuff out of frame um so in theory four by three would at four four three rather would be um easier to reframe but it wouldn't be great as a as a standard for your your long form videos um so the answer really is no i'd stick with 16 16 by nine um yeah personally that's what that's what i do uh second question is how do you recommend people grow their their x formerly known twitter or as, as twitter audience um, I'm not the best person to ask this, to be honest, Mike, because I'm not very good at growing it myself. So I think on Twitter slash X, I've got two and a bit thousand, no, is it even that? I don't even think I've hit 2,000 followers on there. Um, but part of the reason for that is because I haven't 
been consistent. I've not I've not done the stuff I've just mentioned already. Really. I've, I've not been consistent. I've not really been that targeted with the with the content I'm putting on there. I'm just having a bit of a laugh with people and putting a few thoughts about tech now and again. That isn't a consistent, concerted effort on on Twitter slash X. Um, again, it comes down to, from what I can see from other people, it comes down to consistency. And it's like any platform, Mike. It's, it's, it's nailing down your audience, really kind of getting tight with the, um, the definition of that person that you want to reach in terms of what they want to learn, the problems they've got, all the normal stuff, you know, they're... they're demographics etc um and then consistently posting and again this is something i'm, I'm going to work on um yeah it's something I'm, I'm going to put some time into uh mike's third question is youtube and invalid traffic is it getting worse right okay need a drink for that one um so if you're not aware I think most people may be aware on here if you follow if you're on twitter and you follow any youtubers you've probably heard this you've probably heard the, the phrase invalid traffic recently um invalid traffic is something that happens uh, you see a, a message basically if you go into youtube studio it will say something like I can't, I can't remember the exact phrasing but it will say something like your ads have been limited temporarily i think it says due to invalid traffic um, and what it does <clears throat> it's basically uh, youtube saying we think your channel has been hit with traffic that has been paid for. So for someone somewhere, it may not be you, but someone has paid for traffic to get, to be sent to your video, to raise them, to, to basically artificially raise the viewing numbers. Um, and there's various various other things I think they, they kind of term as invalid traffic. The, the point being, they don't think those views were from real people. And because of that, they take, I don't think they take the views away I think the I think I think the views remain. I might be wrong with that, but what they do do is take the, any revenue attached to those views. So if you had a, a video that could potentially have earned three thousand dollars because of it had hundreds of millions of views, um, but if YouTube deems eighty percent of them invalid, it takes eighty percent of that revenue away. And you can't do anything about it. They just take it. Um, what's happening at the moment, I have to be very careful with this because there's no proof that this is what's happening, that what a lot of people is happening is happening. Um, but uh, quite a few YouTube channels, particularly in tech for some reason, are getting hit with this invalid traffic notification and they're having their earn earnings stripped back considerably. Um, some people have lost 90% of their, their monthly earnings through AdSense. Um, it's pretty rough, to be honest. And it seems just it's hitting people at random. Um, something else that's been happening that I've witnessed on my channel is these very strange um, kind of fake comments. They're, they're very weird. They're, they're comments where, at first glance, they look um, genuine. And it's normally someone saying something like, this is an amazing video. Um, what you should do is check out the... Not, not pointing people in, in, in the direction of a link or something. It's just, you know, you should check out this... Um, you should do this to make it even better, whatever. This very kind of generic content, uh, comment. But you get lots of them, of them at once. And they're all written in a way that just looks a bit suspicious. Um, and what some people are suggesting, the people that have had the invalid traffic thing come up uh, and had their, their earnings cut are suggesting that, it, suggesting that it coincided with these strange comments, like a big flood of these really weird comments. Um, and people are calling this invalid traffic thing a bug. So you might see on Twitter people say, X, people say... <laughs> Um, I'm just going to call it Twitter, uh, but, you, but you might see on on there people saying, uh, referring to it, referring to it as the invalid traffic bug, and they're kind of hammering YouTube about it, hammering YouTube help. The creator li liaison Rene Ritchie is getting absolutely pelted with it at the moment. Um, I've put the boot in a bit as well because although it hasn't happened to me yet, and touch wood, I hope it doesn't. Um, I've kind of I've seen my friends get hit by it and other people that I admire get hit by it. Um, and what's what's annoying is that we're not really getting as creators, we're not getting any concrete information back. There's quite a lot of radio silence going on with this. And that the problem with that, what well, was two issues. One of them is that we need that support. This is really scary. You know, if you rely on YouTube as a, as a source of income and if AdSense is a significant part, it shouldn't be the only part, but if it's a significant part um, of your income, the, the at the moment, I'm worrying that every time I go into YouTube Studio, I'm going to refresh it and see that message. That's what I'm worried about at the moment. So we need some reassurance that whatever this thing is, whether it's a bug or they've been hacked or there's something else, we just need a bit of reassurance that they're looking into it. They're not giving us that at the moment. That that's the That's the main 
issue with this. And the second issue with it is, is that because they're not giving us any, any information, all of these rumors and thoughts and kind of malicious, you know, people thinking it's malicious and it's something that YouTube have done wrong, all of this, these, these things start to kind of fall into the conversation. And that may not be the case at all. But like I said, I've, I've, I have no idea why it's happening. I'm not accusing uh, YouTube of anything. You know, I, I don't know. I, I'm as in the dark as everyone as everyone else but it's just the lack of information coming from youtube about it is really frustrating and it doesn't help us as creators you know we, we youtube is nothing without us if we don't upload videos youtube doesn't exist and if you're upload, uploading videos consistently and you're doing so you're doing doing it by all the rules that you're supposed to abide by and you're making great content and people like it and your channel's growing why on earth should you be hit by something that could potentially be a bug but something that isn't right you know, this stuff isn't right. Um, something's wrong beyond your control. Why should you lose out on a revenue from that? doesn't make any sense. So long way of answering your question, Mike. Um, is it getting worse? I don't know if it's getting worse. I've got no numbers around that. Um, but I, you do see a lot of people getting hit by it. So I'm just hoping, touch wood, cross fingers, if you can all do the same thing, that whatever it is, is just going to go away. It would be nice to know if it goes away, why it's gone away, and what it is. But yeah, it's, it's frightening. I'll be completely honest. It's, it's scary. Um, uh, last question from Mike. This is on the email, by the way, guys, which is why I'm looking over here. So again, if you're watching this in the future and you've got questions and you, because you can't um, attend these live streams, just email them to mark at markellismedia.uk and I'll pick them up there. Uh, so the last random question from Mike, he's, he's called it a random question. Um, of the current crop of British drivers, who will be the next F1, uh, F1 world champion? completely off topic mike but i'll let you off because i love f1 and um, i i really hope genuinely genuinely hope it's george russell um i'm, I'm a mercedes fan I, I like i like the whole team i love toto um i want toto to be my dad no offense dad my dad's still around and my dad's my dad uh, but you know you know one of those blokes just think he'd be a really cool dad if my dad wasn't here which would be terrible this i'm digging a massive hole here dad doesn't watch these thankfully i love my dad he's, he's the best dad in the world but if toto is my dad that would be just as cool is that what I'm trying to say? No idea. Um, I told you this would be a strange live stream. Um, yeah, George Russell, I think he's a really nice lad. Um, great driver, very consistent driver, although he's not been doing great recently. Um, I'd love to see something about him. The, the way he handled that thing between him and Max, when Max called him a... Um, and he, he was just class. The, the, the interviews afterwards, Max versus George, in terms of the way they presented themselves about it, he was leagues ahead in terms of maturity and yeah the sportsmanship and all that I, I just like that guy I, I want I, I think he will I think give him time I can't I'm not sure how old he is he's ridiculously young but um give him a few years I think he'll be he'll be up there I think he'll win a world championship fingers crossed thanks Mike for your questions really appreciate that um nice to get some email questions right what have we got in the chat keep them coming guys we've got a bit longer like I say, if you want to ask any questions about the event I went to, the EFA thing, or working with brands, etc., just stick them in the in the chat. Uh, Chris, at Twitter, I'm going to call it Twitter. As much as I begrudge the blue tick subscription, uh, my experience is that having having it gets more interaction. Your tweets do take priority. Yeah, I think that's a very good point. I should have mentioned that before, actually, um, when whoever it was that asked the uh, was it Richard. Um, about posting frequency i think one one thing unfortunately with twitter is that they they have very much it's i i've seen it i've, I've seen the, the the number of I, I don't have the blue tick at the moment i had it briefly but i i didn't I end up not paying for it in, in the end um but since i haven't had it i've seen the number of the amount of reach i can get on my tweets when i'm not when i don't have the blue tick even when i post things which are, i think are interesting don't have external links in them they don't really go anywhere. Um, then you look at other people's tweets that are really getting big, big views and lots of comments and stuff. They've all got blue ticks. So it's clear the way we're being pushed here. Um, and it's only a matter of time before I do get the blue tick because I do like Twitter. I've, I've said this before on, on this live stream. Um, no, matter, no matter what you think of Elon Musk, um, I like Twitter as a platform. I don't agree that it's gone downhill since he's come on board personally. If you do, fight me in the comments. Because um, uh, I, I focus on it as a, as a community, and I've built a lovely community. I've, I've, I've constructed a community on there of just, just by following people that I admire or like or are my friends, um, and I engage with content that I enjoy. And the, the algorithm is pretty good. It does seem to recommend the right stuff. Um, but, yeah, in terms of being a creator on there and publishing and getting reach and getting people to interact, it's not 
didn't nothing really happens to be completely honest unless you've got a blue tick um which isn't it's not expensive but it's not cheap either it's, it would be another for me it's quite an obvious quite an easy thing to, to justify because it's a business expense and i can see it as an investment in my my reach as a creator um but if you're not uh, if you're not and you just want to use twitter to, to reach as many people as possible not from business business perspectives business perspective it's a tough sell i think um yeah it's a tough sell really Right. Have we got any questions that I missed? If you've got any more, any, any last questions, guys, just stick them in the chat window, please. As always, Jacob is helping people in the chat. That's, what, that's why he's here, really. He's, um, he knows more than me about most of this stuff. So Jacob will always get in. <laughs> in fact, Jacob's asked a question. Um, are, you, are you in a situation where you are bombarded by offers or it's more about you are trying to open the gates by cold email. Um, so most of the brand opportunities, whether it, whether it be these events that you go to, you know, invites to events or sponsorships or whatever it might be, um, or product reviews, etc., they tend to come passively. Um, there's, there's only been a couple recently where I've proactively reached out. Uh, the most notable one really actually is on my wrist now, which is the uh, Garmin uh, stuff. So this is the Garmin Epix Pro. But before this, I had the Garmin, Garmin rather, Phoenix 7 Pro. And these are both review units, which have been loaned to me. Um, and they, I only got them because I did the cold cold email thing. I, could basically, I, I reached out and said, any chance we can work together? I've got quite a big audience for Apple Watch content. People keep asking me for Garmin reviews. Can we work together? And bless them, they got in touch. They, they replied within a day. And uh, they loaned me the, the previous watch, sent that back. They've now sent me this out on a longer term loan. And uh, yeah, but that's very rare. Mo most of the stuff that you see on the Marketless Reviews channel, or most of the events that I go to, have just come to me. And I think, again, I think I've, I've talked about this before on these live streams. If you're consistent and if you, you just work on building your, your audience, getting the numbers up, you know, making the best content you can, really narrowing down your audience, your channel will grow naturally. It just, it just will grow. Um, and as you do that, you will get spotted. You'll get spotted by PR agencies and brands, normally PR agencies who work for brands. Um, th the thing to remember with this is that that is a job. People are paid to sit there in an office. This might not be how they do it. They, they, I know they use platforms for this, but essentially they're paid to sit there and find people, creators, you know, in, influencers to connect with brands and that's what they do and they, they find you they find that's why it's so important to have your email address in the description of your video that's generally how they get hold of you that they'll go and th they'll find you and say, okay he's got hundred thousand subscribers great he makes the sort of content we're looking for watch 10 seconds of his vi what, couple of videos yeah he, he presents himself well does whatever 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 then they'll look in the description for contact details and if you haven't got any contact details in there they'll, they'll, they'll move on they won't i don't think they'd spend much time hunting down your email address because there are so many other people they could contact so make it easy for them to get in touch um but they do come to you so if you as long all you've got to do this is the great news about this industry is that you don't have to do cold calling cold emailing i thought you'd have to do that when, when i first got into this i thought okay i'm gonna to have to devote you know x amount of time each week each month to reaching out to brands to, and I, I did that for, for quite a while for two or three months when i first started i had like a system where i was you know emailing microsoft and apple <laughs> and uh you know samsung and bose and all these other brands um and then doing follow-up emails and i got a couple of bites i did have, microsoft got back to me a couple of times nothing came of that unfortunately but they did get back to me uh, sennheiser got back to me and sent me some stuff but the amount of work i was putting into it was ridiculous looking back very again very wet behind the ears didn't know what i was doing um whereas if i'd known myself if i if i could tell myself back then if i could say one thing to myself back then it would be stop doing that cold emailing stuff stop it just get rid of the, the spreadsheet and just make content because they will come if you build it they do actually come um so yeah in answer to your question Jacob um 98 percent probably of the stuff that I get and uh, work with and get invited to comes to me that's one very important point actually about these live event things uh, when people when brands invite you to these events that are overseas um you uh, they come out of the blue completely they just end up in your inbox and sometimes you get them via dms on instagram and stuff like that but generally speaking it, it's, it's an email um but they they all bless them. this is one thing i wish was a bit different <laughs> it's always very last minute so you you perhaps get at the most a month's notice but that's quite long i've had it two weeks out 
a week out, I think, once. Uh, and a couple of times I've not been able to make it because of life and other things that have been booked in. Um, so if any brands are watching this, you're probably not, but if you are, PR agencies, I know this is, I wouldn't want your job. It's, it's very difficult, but if we can have as much lead time as possible, which, and you probably are giving us as much as you can, because I, I know a lot of these events are just kind of, yeah, the, the last thing is let's get some PR, let's get some PR going as well. But yeah, if we can be involved nearer the start of the process, that would be great. <laughs> but yeah, you don't get a huge amount of time to to get yourself ready for it, basically. Right, I'm just searching through the comments. Any more questions that I've missed? Impartiality, Matt, that was the word I was trying to think of when I was talking about, what was I talking about? Um, yeah, remaining impartial about you, you, the product that you're reviewing or the brand that you, you've been invited to. That is the word that was was not, coming to mind impartiality no matter what these brands do for you in terms no matter how much lobster they feed you i've never been fed lobster um no matter how many you know beers they can kind of give you or open bars there are or you know product release or swag that you get in terms of caps and pins and you know bags and water bottles and things um you have to remain impartial they're not doing this stuff to try and make you say lovely lovely things about the products they want there's two things they want they want you to cover the, the event and generate some noise around their brand and they want you to be honest there's been a couple of instances where i've been very honest with the brands either before i've, I've made videos or afterwards to explain why i didn't like a, a particular thing um and every time i've done that without without um uh you know without fail they've always thanked me for it they've always been very grateful for the for the feedback even if it's not particularly good feedback if it's like you know this product was almost amazing, but it's just spoiled by this. I'd much rather tell them that because then they can feed that back to the product teams and hopefully the next version will fix that thing. It might break something else, but it might fix the thing that I found. Um, so impartiality, as Matt has correctly got the right word. Um, I might need you for the rest of the evening, Matt, just to be my brain, if you don't mind. That'd be great. I'll just keep you on the phone. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, impartiality is really important, no matter what's done for you. Guys, I am going to have another quick drink of water. I am going to love you and leave you. Thank you so much, guys, for being on the live stream. If you've been here asking questions and just being here for an hour with me, um, it means that means the world. Um, if you're watching the future, thank you as well. And just very quickly, just to remind you, remind you all, uh, the Substack newsletter link below. Just check it out. Just for one week, just see what I send you. And like I say, if you don't enjoy it, you can just unsubscribe. If you do, then every every Friday you'll get another email from me. Um, and secondly, if you've got any interest whatsoever in the Mark Ellis Academy, where I'm going to open up this business even more in even more depth to reveal how I do things, how I built it, how I deal with brands, how I make videos, how, how I, you know, the, in, the entire content process from writing a blog to turning that blog into a video and then shorts, etc. all the content repurposing, the business aspects of it, everything is going into that academy. Um, and I'm very excited about it. Um, there's lots more news to come on that. Some of it is going to be quite interesting, I think, actually, in terms of the way that I'm going to do this. It might be a little bit unusual, potentially. Uh, but if you're interested in hearing more about that, you're not, you're not, if you sign up to this, you're not getting any, it's not, um, you know, you're not locking yourself into the academy. You're just signing up to hear more news about it. And again, you can unsubscribe at any time, but that link is below as well. So double check that. Double check check it out whatever oh god i need to go to bed uh thanks guys thank you i'm gonna do the end stream thing now and um have wonderful evenings rest of your days whatever you're doing and i'll catch you next week cheers guys <laughs>